Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 18th edition of Talk 20 Hatch. I'm Carrie Mayu, and alongside my partners Jackson Swear and Ryan Deal, um, and the whole fabulous staff of the Hutchinson Public Library, we are so excited that you're here with us tonight. So there's a grounding exercise that I like to use with groups to help them connect as individuals and build trust as a team. Some of you in this room have likely been asked to do this by me in a meeting one time or another, and for that I say you're welcome. Um, the four prompts to this exercise are, who are you? Where do you come from? Why are you here? And where are you going? And I was, as I was putting together all of the presenter slides for tonight and, and making all the timing work and everything and, and seeing everybody's photos, I couldn't help but think how many, so many of them seek to answer these questions in some way. Who am I? Where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? And when I think about all of us together, who are we as a community? Where do we individually and collectively come from? Why are we all here tonight, but also in this particular part of Kansas and Hutchinson and Reno County? And where are we all going together? And so don't worry, I'm not going to make you turn to your neighbor and answer all those questions right now. Um, but I do ask that you kind of sit with them tonight. Um, maybe ask of them of yourself later tonight when you're um, at home or on the car ride home or, you know, having a, a beverage with um, a friend. I am going to ask you uh, to stand like we normally do um, when I ask you a question. So we want to show a little bit of, a, of who's in the room right now. Um, we like to get a sense of who's in the audience, and we like to honor those who have been with us on this journey over the last almost 10 years, and also those of you who are new to this room with us. Um, so first question, please stand up if you felt the crazy house rattling thunder around 3 a.m. last <laughs> night. Yeah, we were all awake together. <laughs> that was wild. <laughs> And if anybody knows like where that lightning hit, I'd love to know. That was crazy. Um, please stand up if you've ever been to Kansas's largest night rodeo, the Pretty Prairie Rodeo, or if you plan to go this weekend. Very nice. So we have made a note not to schedule Talk 20 on a night of Pretty, pretty, pretty Rodeo going forward. Um, now please stand if you are one of our previous 170 presenters at Talk 20 Hutch over the last nine and a half years. Awesome, thank you guys for coming back. Stand if your child is here tonight. <laughs> Got one? <Yay! laughs> right? There are lots of kids. Um, now please stand if this is your very first Talk 20 Hutch that you've been to. Awesome. Well, we welcome you all. We hope you have. Um, we hope you have a wonderful evening um, here in the room with all of your neighbors. And if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, um, go ahead and say hello in the comments and tell us where you're watching from. Um, so here's how we talk about Talk 20. Talk 20 is not a lecture, but a gathering, an informal exchange of stories and ideas. Talk 20 is an experience, a night when you should expect the unexpected. Talk 20 is not exclusive, but inclusive. It runs on the idea that everyone has a story to tell. Talk 20 is curiosity, open minds, humor, heartbreak, education. Talk 20 is what we make it. Tonight, you're going to hear a little bit of everything. Each of our 10 presenters will have 20 slides and only 20 seconds per slide to tell a story. We'll have a brief 10 minute intermission after the first five. And then after the event, we hope you'll join us casually at Sand Hills Brewing downtown to continue the conversations sparked by tonight's presentations. Because Talk 20 doesn't end with the 10th presenter, it continues through the connections we make, the conversations we have, the moments months from now when we recall a talk, an image, or a storyteller that stayed with us. So let's get started. Here's Jackson to introduce our first presenter.
NAACP Youth fosters community relationships, promoting racial harmony, and encourages civic engagement through their works. Please welcome several members of Hutchinson and NAACP Youth with a glimpse into the future. Our NAACP youth work to educate our community on the importance of exercising the right to vote. Here is a few of us registered citizens to vote at the Boys and Girls Club. In 2020, our youth were responsible for 20% of the new Reno County voters. Our youth group leaders, Chuck Crumble, Heather Job, and the NAACP Religious Affairs, Michael Job, our youth group leadership work to encourage NAAC and educate and grow our NAACP youth. Juneteenth is an annual event that the youth work hard to put together. Here are a few of the kids setting up one of the tents at Chester I. Lewis Plaza for the 2022 Juneteenth event. Every Juneteenth, we have a talent show, and this year, I was the talent show winner. <laughs> After Juneteenth, the youth spend a day at the Reno County Farmer's Market. They share with everyone more about their urban garden and read a couple books to the kids about Juneteenth and what the holiday celebrates. So I thought after I would sing, I would get the 200. Then they told me that I had to go to this and sing again. But I got the 200. <laughs> the NAACP Youth organized a group photo with the NAACP Youth and Hutchinson Youth, or Hutchinson NAACP chapter for the time capsule that was buried in 2022 outside City Hall. The city or organists sometimes impose penalties for homeowners who whose homes don't meet certain standards. Here, the NAACP youth got together to paint a home for a family at no charge. They didn't they did a great job and they had a lot of fun. Oh wait, I was I was doing it backwards. NAACP <laughs> youth members Lexi and Malia with NAACP youth leader Chuck and the NAACP youth were at King Day celebrations at Stringer Fine Arts where Malia gave a speech on what King Day meant to her. Some of our youth along the religious affairs, Mike Job, getting the float ready for the Emancipation Day Parade in August. Alex Carvalho is here pictured helping his daughter Athena plant seeds for the youth garden. The youth garden helps us, the youth, learn how to plant, grow, and harvest fruit and vegetables from our garden. Here, the NAACP youth is pictured along with NAACP Vice President Calvin Wright. The youth got together to help serve hot dogs at the Emancipation Jazz in the Park celebration. Delicious. <laughs> While the Hutchinson Fire Department often comes out to help fill a dunk tank, for the Bridge Builders barbecue celebration, they also gave the kids a quick cool off from the hard work of setting up. You guys should also come July 27th. <laughs> Here, planting day is pictured at the NAACP Youth Garden. The youth learns hands-on experiences with skills planting, growing, and harvesting, along with the taking care of many garden animals. Here, Rose is pictured carrying straw for the chickens. We have many different animals in the garden, including chickens, quail, and rabbits. One of the animals the youth learn about and care for are Cortanix quails. The quails are a new addition to the garden this year. Italian honeybees are another new addition to the garden this year. Italian honeybees are one of the gentlest breeds of bees and provide 
a great source of honey in learn. And LACP youth members rose in Shiloh with their rabbits. Garden participants are paired with their own personal animals to care for in addition to the group learning and chores. Here, Rose and Shiloh are learning to handle and groom their New Zealand rabbits. One of the best parts about learning about our culture history is the food. Here, youth member Ruby is teaching the rest of us how to make Mexican meatballs. They are so good. The first Bridge Builders Barbecue, the NAACP youth created this event along with the HPD to help bridge the gap between our youth and the police officers. We are excited to be preparing for our fourth annual event this year. HPD officer showing some of our youngest members how the police drone works during the barbecue. Part of our Bridge Builders Barbecue is team building activities that the officers and the local youth participate in joint. They, the teams have great time and get to know each other in the non-threatening environment. This year is the fourth annual Bridge Builders Barbecue. The event is Thursday, July 27th at 6 p.m. at the Home Builders Building at Cary Park. We are proud to host this event along with P HPD Hutch in Harmony in the Kansas Hutch. <laughs> We're going to see if that helps. Maybe not. Musical theater includes all the art forms. 3D is the actor's body in space and how that body is used. 2D is drawing and painting, and in quilters, the individual quilt blocks. Music, the, th the songs and the actual rhythm of the scenes. Dance, the actors moving through space. And acting, the creation of different characters. In fact, theater can prepare you for any career because it instills creativity, work ethic, and confidence, whether one is on or off stage. Here's Kristen Anschutz with Quilters, True Women's Stories, Moving West. My husband and I have directed many musicals over the years, but this was the most challenging. Quilters is an unusual musical in that it doesn't have a through plot line. There's just scene after scene and song, and everything is around a, a quilt block and what the quilt block means. The actresses were expected to sing, to dance, to get down on the floor, get up again, and to play many, many characters, boys, girls, women, and men. And so we had to look really hard for them. This, in this first musical song, Pieces of Our Lives, the characters sing about how each piece of fabric tells a story within a block and how the block itself tells a story. The fabric could be new or old. And then the one thing that connected the stories was Sarah, who started the play with her life and making a quilt and writing a letter to her daughters. And she said, we need to make these quilts, her legacy quilt. And so the stories began, and here is on the road to Rocky, Kansas, in a wagon. And the quilting hoops represent the wagon. The slide shows the women on the Rocky Road and to Kansas, and the characters and movement. Hardships were 
faced with blizzards, fires, and death. In this scene, 11-year-old Katie is taking care of her sick younger sister during a blizzard, and her father goes out and he freezes to death. And all these stories are based on real life. And her sister dies, and her mother dies, and 11-year-old Katie is left all alone. And as they play children, there are upbeat songs like Thread the Needle. Not only do the adult women make quilts, but the, the little kids are expected to come in every once in a while and thread the needle so they can keep quilting. Here the children sing about how they make their own dolls. They had a Cornelia doll and a Cornelius doll, and they made it out of corn husks and corn cobs, and then they got married, and they started begatting all those little children. In this scene, Sarah plays herself as a child, learning how to quilt. Her mother says, it's time for you to learn how to quilt, Sarah. And Sarah's trying really hard, and she's so excited. But her quilt stitches are so big, and they're not 11 stitches per inch like her mother could do. And here, Sarah passes down to her daughter quilting materials. She goes through her scrap bags, and she shows the lights and the darks and tells about each scrap and what it means to her and who wore it. And so she hands on her scrap bag to her daughter, and each scrap has a purpose and a memory. In the uh, Sarah Winkler is holding the log cabin block here, and... The log cabin block started the whole log cabin story. So each block introduced a story. And here we have the log cabin block. And, you'll, and these children are little kids. They played little kids again. And they had just finished building, helping their mother and dad build a large log cabin. And they are so excited that they are playing games in the cabin because they moved out of a dugout. Later, the cabin burns to the ground and the children all survive. At the end of the log cabin story, the children are afraid of the house and the noises that the logs make as they're settling in and as the floors creak. And so they make up stories. What's going on? Why is it happening? Here, Caroline Miller informs her mother that if the logs are talking to each other and they're still growing, the house will grow too. Not only do the actors portray children, but they play adults. And here we have a birthing scene, because many births happened on the way west. This scene was particularly difficult for some women because they hadn't had a baby before. This next scene was difficult for the actors because it concerned the birth and death of babies. These two sisters wrote letters back and forth to each other, and they were concerned about the number of babies they had. The woman on the right ended up aborting her 12th baby. Faith played a large role in these women's lives. Many of the scenes in quilters, like this one, that include singing the doxology, were juxtaposed against a scene of great tragedy. Many songs were extra difficult because they had to be sung a cappella. Right in the middle of singing, there's a great prairie fire. And representing that fire is this red fabric and lights that were blinking on and off, and sound, because the fire burned down the entire town of Tyrone, Oklahoma, and all the surrounding areas. This slide shows all the beginnings of all the emotions that one monologue could take you through. Piper Harding played Cassie, and she had to be, she started out happy, joyous, shock, grief, numbness, and ended up with hope. And the actors sing about that hope and about how the quilts they made tell the stories of their lives, just like the quilts we make today tell the stories of our lives. Sarah and her six daughters in the show. And Sarah's last line is, whatever you do, don't bury me in my best quilt. Quilters was written for a regional theater in Denver and performed in New York City on Broadway, and it was panned by the reviewers in the 1980s, but it did win seven Tony Awards. 
Our, final sh our next show in our season is The Quality of Life, which explores one of the most profound questions we face every day, and that is how to deal with death. Despite the heavy subject matter, there is humor in the show. This show is suggested for mature audiences, and tickets are available at Hutch, stage9hutch.com or at the box office. Thank you. Many Kansas homes still have original electrical wiring that simply hasn't stood the test of time and poses some real safety risks. This situation has shaped Stephen M. Brown's life in a big way over the past decade, gradually carving out his unique place in serving our community. More than anything, this is a story of how Stephen has grown as a person, developed a rock star team, and how they plan to do their part in making Kansas a safer place to live, one home at a time. Here's Stephen with Rewiring Kansas. I'm Steven, I'm an electrician, and what brings me here today is that houses are old. Um, if you look at the center there, the darker red colors, that's uh, by county in the United States. The darker it is, the older the homes are. And they said no statistics, so I'm only gonna give you one statistic, and that's more than half the homes in Reno County are more than 60 years old. That's just to give you an idea. Here's a picture of Hutchinson. I think 105 years ago. So you have to go back in time to understand this because um, it's not like today where we put wiring, we build a home and we put wiring in it. It was a big deal back then. Um, and you can see they, they initially wired the homes for what they used. So they finally got to have light. And then all of a sudden people said, oh, I need a fan. I need um, a toaster. And the inventions just kept going on and on. It got a little bit ridiculous, actually. Um, but most of the time, that original wiring did stay in place. And unfortunately, when people didn't maintain these homes over the years, this is sometimes what you end up with. And so this is something I see regularly. And uh, it's something that I'm quite passionate about uh, sharing with people. So how did I end up in this? I never would have thought I would be here talking about electrical, but I was a musician and I thought I would be touring the country and writing the biggest songs. And, but I found this woman and I said, I have to secure this woman. So I need a real job and, and I'm gonna have to make some money. So I went and got a job at the Grand Elevator. Uh, I worked there for five years and had a great time there, met a lot of friends. I uh, learned about every job I could. There's only so much dust you can sweep. But once I caught up with my tasks, I liked to follow the electrician around and see what he did. And that was the most fascinating thing to me. So I decided to go into electrical. And this here shows you my first day working in a residential job. Um, I was left in a bathroom by myself with little clue what to do. And I blew up uh, my new pair of pliers. And from that day forward, I also got shocked a few times in the weeks to come. I said, I really need to understand how this electricity stuff works. Um, so I got to studying code and electrical theory. I was kind of the nerd on the jobs because when we drove between jobs, I was just had my face buried in the book. I really wanted to understand this stuff. Um, and working for other employers, I learned all types of electrical experience. We did new construction, commercial, industrial things. Um, and I enjoyed all of those things. Um, but most of all, when I looked at all of the jobs that I worked at, it seemed like the most dangerous things that I found were actually in people's homes. And sometimes those things are really obvious, like what you see in the picture here. You might see that and, and be freaked out. Um, but other times it's not as obvious. And this is where what just fascinated me, like a factory, if something was wrong, they would shut it down and fix the problem right away. Um, but in a home, sometimes you don't know that the problem's there. Like in these pictures, everything looked normal on the outside 
until we found these atrocious problems. I wish I could explain all these. But the bottom left one there, you can see that's pretty new wiring, new situation. It's just they didn't have spark protection. So I decided that I could do something about this. I can make these homes safe. And I took out the worst loan ever. I had no money. I had no customers here. I had been working in a previous area. But I said, I can survive for about two and a half months, and then I need to find 20 hours of work. So this is me after I realized, oh, unfortunately, people don't call electricians until things stop working. So this is me working at Applebee's for a few days because I was broke. I couldn't stand working with the teenagers. And uh, so I said, I have to figure this thing out. So I said, we'll just do the best job that we can. We'll be extra clean. We'll explain things well. We'll be very thorough with our plans. And uh, things did start to pick up traction. Um, we're starting to make great relationships with customers. And this is how I dealt with the older wiring that I did. I did my very best. I made all the connections really nice. I put the best devices in possible. There you can see a box extension because the box was set too deep in the wall. Thousands of details like that that I cared so much about. But then I, set, I kept finding things like this, like the one on the left, where if a plumber would have taken apart the wrong pipe, he would have died that day. And that's really what we're dealing with. Thankfully, accidents don't happen very often, but some of the things I saw were just just crazy. So I said, we have to figure this out. How can we make these houses safe? So we trained all of our team thoroughly. We, we talked about how does electricity work? Let's make sure we can explain it to everyone. Um, let's make sure that we do the best job possible because, you know, another thing I figured out was, this is just very recent. I said, well, we must have a business selling something no one wants. We, we, have to, we have to replace this wiring. And that was kind of the solution that was staring me in the face for a long time, but no one ever asked us to rewire homes. So beginning this year, we have started talking more about it to people. People have been very open and we're finding affordable ways to rewire people's homes and educate them without the technical jargon as much as possible. This is our amazing team so far. I couldn't do it without them. And this is my way of educating. Um, if you go to safehomequiz.com, that there's a six, sex, six question quiz that you can do in like three minutes and kind of get an idea how safe your electrical is in your home. Um, so that's my goal is to educate people on that and make Kansas a safer place to live one home at a time. People with severe mental illnesses often exist in a system of crisis, trying to find effective treatment for their symptoms, obtaining stable housing, and finding security through employment. The Clubhouse Movement seeks to establish supportive communities where individuals can focus on their strengths and their recovery. Through a small grant, Milestone Clubhouse colleagues were able to begin transforming their environment from crisis mode to a safe and welcoming, strengths-based community. They will show you how they're doing it. Please welcome Jewel Muir and Katie Gibbons from with From Crisis to Community, the Clubhouse Way. Clubhouse International is a membership organization of more than 300 locally managed clubhouses in the U.S. and across the world. Through friendship, shared work, education, and employment, clubhouses help people living with mental illness regain hopeful and fulfilling lives. Milestone Clubhouse in Hutchison opened in August 2019 and it is one of the newest.
We wanted to be the best clubhouse possible. After two years, we were still struggling. Members were often in crisis and we were prone to react. Many of us knew little about how to be an accredited clubhouse. Then came the gift to dream opportunity from the Hutchinson Community Foundation asking one question. If granted funding to dream, how would we spend it and why? We submitted a proposal and wondered if we could win. We got it. We were so excited we jumped out of our chairs. It was quite a kind of situation, silly thing. Uh, the original plan was to send a large group to visit two clubhouses in Oklahoma, but instead we sent a smaller group to Oklahoma and another to Nebraska. After learning best practices, we would meet to share ideas and identify solutions to make Milestone Clubhouse stronger. Our first stop, Thunderbird Clubhouse in Norman, Oklahoma. We went to learn how to make our work order day more organized and run smoother. We met members and staff and worked alongside them throughout the day. We attended meetings, shared meals, and learned a better way to track numbers. Clubhouse programs are not effective unless all colleagues are invested in the process. Thunderbird Clubhouse business unit tracks and sorts paperwork that needs entered into the database or filed. Everything is clearly marked so they have more inclusion among members and staff to take charge and get work done. They also have a great system of tracking mail for homeless members who use the clubhouse address for incoming mail by setting up a member post office. Thunderbird Clubhouse uses a whirling whiteboard as a calendar to keep members informed of upcoming events at the clubhouse and surrounding community. They also post staffing and socials on this board in the wellness unit. Not all was hard work. We had a fun uh, evening social to attend, carving and painting pumpkins, and cementing friendships. Most people who experience a mental health challenge will also experience isolation, stigma, and depression. The purpose of the social club is to socialize and make new friendships within the community and the broader com within the clubhouse and the broader community, as well as to encourage member involvement. After a full and busy day at the clubhouse, we met that night around the fire pit and discussed the ideas and things we learned to bring back to Milestone and put into implementation while making uh, and eating s'mores. We liked visiting Thunderbird Clubhouse to see how they operated. Next stop was Liberty Center in Norfolk, Nebraska. We arrived in the evening on time to attend the clubhouse's social program, a pre-Thanksgiving dinner, and bingo or Milestone Clubhouse cleaned them out of prizes. Of this group traveling, two members of one staff had previously visited the Oklahoma Clubhouse. We felt it important to have some folks who had gone to both. In Norfolk, we stayed at a beautiful Airbnb. You can see our staff member page waving from the downstairs of where, we, of where we stayed. We were able to play pool and ping pong to relax and de-stress. We used the downstairs space for planning our final visit at Liberty Center Clubhouse and discuss what we learned and might want to implement at Milestone. Again, we took note on how organized everything was. In the business unit, we attended meetings and learned about their employment and housing programs. There are no staff-only or member-only spaces in a clubhouse, so the type and arrangement of furniture is very important in creating a space that reflects the clubhouse's shared ownership by members and staff. Large whiteboards are a common method in Clubhouse for identifying work that needs to be done. According to the Clubhouse standards, all work of the Clubhouse should be accessible by members. Members as well as staff should be involved in the development and management of the Clubhouse budget. Many Clubhouses utilize snack bars as a way to provide food options in case of a health reason or a missed meal. Staff and Clubhouse members learn how the Liberty Center Clubhouse ran their snack bar um, we learned tips and tricks to implement a running and running our own snack bar at Milestone. The wellness unit work board is where members volunteer for the various tasks in that area. Members sign up for work that they are interested in. All work is meaningful and needed for the clubhouse to operate day to day. It shows the next day's meal if members wanted to know ahead of time. We took that idea and made a weekly menu board for our clubhouse. Once back in Hutchison, we met another time at Dillon's Nature Center for a follow-up retreat to discuss everything we learned and begin the planning process of implementing our new ideas. Both groups that traveled as well as those who stayed behind recorded our thoughts and posted them on the wall for all to see. Decisions were made by consensus in the clubhouse to encourage involvement by all. While at Dillon Nature Center, we brainstormed several things. Why do we come to clubhouse? What do we think we can do better and we split the clubhouse into two distinct units the business unit and the wellness unit we also decided which task each unit would take on or which 
unit the task belonged. Members also chose which unit they felt they were mostly interested in working. As a community, we felt our own, we needed our own mission statement. We brainstormed several different components from the three groups we formed. We answered three questions in our mission statement. Who do we serve? What do we do? And why do we do it? We wrote up everything we came up with and came to a consensus, a consensus on one unique mission statement for our clubhouse. The supports we provide are many and varied. Our unique mission statement describes exactly what we try to do every day in every way for our clubhouse members. Our clubhouse family comes together as a community to fight mental health stigma and provide supports to people to achieve milestones. We are truly grateful to the Hutchinson Community Foundation for the gift to dream. It is not often that an organization such as ours has the opportunity to take the time to reflect, be creative, and explore ways we can grow. We had the chance to see how the cycle of crisis depleted our energy and attention. The structural elements we have implemented help us focus on recovery. We see ourselves as one big family helping each other. We advocate for others in finding mental health stigma by educating our legislators and the community about challenges we face living with mental illness. These are a few members of our big growing Kansas Clubhouse family. Thank, Thank you, you for, for listening, listening to, to our, our story. story. Sports fans in the region will know the voice of Rusty Hilst for his years in broadcasting, and many students, including yours truly, had the privilege uh, to receive their math education from the best math teacher I ever had, Rusty Hilst. Please welcome Dan Kochnock Nakarado for Rally for Hutch. Or yes, Rally for Hutch. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Rally for Hutch too, but Rally for Reno, supporting his friend Rusty Hilst's story and battle with ALS. Lots of us appreciate Rusty Hilst, and we want you to appreciate him too. So this is Rally for Rusty. Russell Allen Hilst earned the respect and affection of students, sports fans, golfers, and friends around our town, our state, and beyond. Always caring and approachable, Rusty lives an adventurous life. The nickname Banana Man came from students. He was often covered in yellow chalk dust as he roamed the halls at Hutchinson High School. A few weeks prior to Christmas 2022, Rusty received a sad diagnosis from doctors at KU Medical Center, ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. They told him, we're sorry to tell you that you have ALS. There is no cure. Here's what will happen in the months ahead. ALS attacks nerve cells that control muscles. As the nerve cells deteriorate, Muscle control and movement are lost. You will lose your ability to speak, to move your body, and ultimately, the ability to breathe. Your mind remains sharp throughout the whole process. Flashback to before Christmas, or right after Christmas, 1942, the firstborn child of Harold and Thelma arrived at Pratt Hospital. Harold was in the South Pacific serving the USA in World War II the first few years of Rusty's life, Seven Hills brothers and sisters joined the Hills family following World War II. Fortunately for us, the Hills family moved from Meade to Hutchinson. Rusty was stricken with rheumatic fever and confined to bed rest for eight months when he was eight years old, and then a heart murmur set him back for several years. But he always maintained a cheerful attitude and was always eager to learn. Rusty graduated from Hutch High in 1960, where he sunk the winning putt to lead Salt Hawk Golf to the 1960 state championship. Not a gimme, it was a 30 to 40 footer. Along the way, he earned an academic scholarship to attend Valparaiso, where he majored in math, and then he came back to Kansas to go to KU for his master's degree. 
Rusty's work ethic, competitive zeal, temperament, and intellect proved to be a winning combination. Seven club championships at Prairie Dunes. Five Hutchinson City championships. Best score ever at Cary Park Golf Course. Hole-in-one aces five times. He also coached Salt Hawk golf teams to 26 consecutive state championship tournaments. The Kansas Golf Association enlisted Rusty to work hundreds of tournaments across the United States for more than 40 years. He was inducted into the Kansas Golf Hall of Fame in 2002. Central Links Golf presents the Rusty Hills Trophy to the reigning Kansas Junior Player of the Year. Mr. Hill started his 54-year teaching career in August 1966. A math teacher resigned on short notice. The principal knew Rusty was a math major at Valparaiso, so he recruited Rusty to fill the vacancy. It was a leap of faith. Mr. Hilst had to quickly earn a teaching certificate through correspondence courses at just about every university in the Big Eight at the time. When I changed careers from the corporate world at Kroger to teach at Hutch CC, Rusty was one of the first mentors I called for advice. He offered three important suggestions that have always stayed with me. Trust your intuition, build relationships with students, and learn to teach without textbooks. When Rusty was named uh, 2004 Sportscaster of the Year, Rusty's mother was quoted in the Hutchinson News, Rusty has always been a talker. She hastened to add that broadcasting is a sideline to teaching math and coaching golf. Rusty, Rusty never skipped a day of school in connection with a broadcast assignment. By the way, that was not Rusty's mother in that previous slide. The Davis Foundation named Mr. Hilst Hutch High's Educator of the Year in 1984. He was honored by the Kansas Senate in 2003 for his teaching and coaching. Recently, Rusty Hilst was inducted into the Kansas Teachers Hall of Fame just earlier this year. Hutchinson's all-time most recognized radio voice belongs to Rusty Hilst. He broadcasted more than 5,000 games through 50 years on the air. He became the first member of Hutch CC's Hall of Fame who was not a coach, player, or administrator. There you see a couple of programs from the NJCAA tournament. He didn't plan to be a teacher. He didn't expect to be a broadcaster. Both roles were thrust upon him. He capably embraced the duties and responsibilities of both for more than 50 years. He covered 50 NJCAA championship tournaments, including the Blue Dragons' three national championships. The Kansas Association of Broadcasters bestowed the Hod Humiston Award upon Rusty in 2005 for significant lifetime contributions. When Rusty retired in 2019, it was most definitely a newsworthy item, and it was the end of an era. An entire week in 2019 was officially declared Rusty Hilst Appreciation Week. USD 308, Hutch CC, and the city of Hutchinson resolved. We congratulate, commend, and thank Rusty Hilst for his dedication to broadcasting for 50 years in a consistent, honest, calm, cordial, professional, fun, engaging manner. What's not like to like about Rusty Hilst? Off the air, we openly shared opinions about sports, politics, news, education, culture, art, music, broadcasting, family. We smile and we laugh together. We smile and we laugh a lot still to this day. Rusty is not only articulate, he's a well-read, deep, clear thinker and a caring listener. He's one of those rare gentlemen who makes a wonderful first impression and then the better you get to know him, the more you like and respect him. Whenever Rusty talks on the radio or across from you at the dinner table, it's worth listening. Students, sports fans, family and friends have always been able to count on Rusty. And now it's our turn to rally for Rusty. We're thrilled that Rusty and his brother Kent are with us here tonight at Talk 20 Hutch. They're in the back of the room. And I just have a request of you. Did you ever play golf with Rusty or see him play? Did you ever have a class with Mr. Hilst? Did you ever hear Rusty Hilst on the radio? Do you appreciate Rusty? If so, please stand up and give him an enthusiastic round of applause.
Thank you so much. What a great start. And we'll be back for more. Um, we will start again at 8 o'clock promptly, which is in about 14 minutes. I'm looking at Carrie because she, uh, just, I'm getting a thumbs up. That was the right thing to say. Oh, great. We will be back at 8 o'clock. You've got a little more than 10 minutes for a break. Stand up. There's some water back in the corner there, restrooms back there. Be back at 8.
It is exactly eight o'clock. I've been watching this right there. So live up to uh, Jackson's word on that one. Welcome back for the second half of Talk 20. Pearl Renee, finding oneself is a difficult task in this world when you're focused on survival, but it is a key part of living your life. Pearl Renee says accepting being a fat, hairy, outspoken Hispanic woman, her words, was a difficult task, but she found her way. Now she is seeking to do the same for others by sharing her story and experiences by spreading radical self-love and self-acceptance. Here's Coral with Becoming Me. Okay, so in true Coral fashion, I decided to throw out the first 12 cards of my speech last night in order to read to you a journal entry that I wrote last night. Um, so enjoy the pictures of me growing up. In the meantime, I will get back to my original speech in the end. But for now, here's the journal entry I wrote last night. Tomorrow, I give my first talk, live and in person. I know I've felt nerves and parts of me, but others are working to tap into that cocky, confident side of me that lovingly and assertively embodies her power. She wears clothes that make her feel powerful and calm, that embodies her beauty relentlessly, unapologetically. She stands in her loving power. She is all she wished to be, a culmination of nights of dreams, lifetimes of dreams, literally, in every sense of the word, indisputably. She, love, she is loved wholly, entirely, by all of those that she surrounds herself with, and she loves them back. She spends her time laughing, getting high on the joy her life brings. She creates art, content, and antiambulos for those around her. She loves all, but she understands that some, tough, some need tough love. She does not mess around. No one ever makes her feel less than, and she checks herself when she feels even a glimpse of superiority. We don't play that game. Her relationships, actions, and words, fully authentic, ever evolving, ever expanding, ever learning, ever teaching, ever reaching, love seeping from her aura, filling those around her with warm feelings. They get to decide how that makes them feel. Some get angry, some jealous, some genuinely accepting the love. Some are even inspired to spread this feeling themselves. I am taking steps into this every day. I thought that the questions at the beginning of this talk were very, very apt <laughs> for my speech. I share my experiences without letting fear freeze me in my tracks by embodying all that I see in myself, loving me for who I am, as I am, becoming me. Originally, my speech was going to fill you in on the abuse that I faced as a child, the trouble that followed, how it drove me first to very self-destructive behaviors, but then I let them drive me to do better. But I also realized that we all focus on the past too much when it comes to currently living our lives. Something that my loving partner said yesterday that really hit me was that he is simply focused on his current chosen family and friends, the life that he has built now. Today is what truly matters, who you choose to be, the way that you spend your time. Today, right now, is all that matters. You get to decide every second of the day. <laughs> In the first part of my story, I talk about my beard, how as a nine-year-old, I genuinely felt like it was a curse, like I was the most <laughs> disgusting, horrible being on the planet. I definitely hated myself, and those around me really did not explain what was going on. I was very confused, and due to some physical, verbal, and sexual abuse in my childhood from two trusted adults that had me from about age three to about age eight, I <laughs> spent a lot of my teenage years in very destructive paths. But around 22, I really started finding my worth. I began to realize that I deserved more. And after a rough ending of a four-year engagement, I worked three jobs to get my business degree. I eventually became a store manager, 
My biggest passion was fixing underperforming stores. This job was my ticket out of Kansas. I moved to Washington and it was terrifying. I didn't know anyone. I had no family or friends there, but it started to give me the space to start finding myself. I really wanted to help others who went through similar trauma as I, and I started a degree in psychology. Eventually, I got my bachelor's, and the scientific studies that I obsessively read allowed me to see myself more clearly. I was quickly becoming educated on the world around me. I realized how biased the scientific community was. It felt really dirty and unethical, so I began to second-guess obtaining my master's degree. But it also, I also dove into as many studies as I could because parts of them were insightful. I became increasingly self-aware, and as I healed, I found my partner, Elias. Elias and I had the hard talks about the traumas that we had faced and the way that it affected our adulthoods. I started to see the trauma responses in my words and in my actions. I wanted to take back my body and my life. I wanted to be back in control. Professionally, I was advancing. I worked in a corporate office for a, multi, a multi-billion dollar company, but emotionally, I felt like a wreck. Then COVID hit. The world turned upside down. Elias and I worked from home. After three months in quarantine, the healing had gotten serious. We began to find a sense of spirituality. This led us to a path to Colorado, and that eventually led us to being homeless. So for two and a half years, we lived in our car. I started seeing people as they really were, just people, most hurting, some sad, some angry, but pretty much everyone around me was stuck in trauma and abuse cycles. I began examining the values that I was upholding and eliminating those that no longer served me. I began to grow my beard after realizing that I was not shaving for me, but for the comfort of other people around me. Growing my beard has been the most difficult challenge in my life. It causes senseless hate and disgust to come my way. I know it is not a curse now, but it's hirsutism, which affects one in 14 women. I now have a community of over 15,000 that I am working to help heal through my experiences. I am blessed to be a healer, clearing paths for those around me. Becoming me by embracing all of my beautiful qualities that I was born with has been freeing. I am loved and supported by the people who see me and accept me as I am. I wish for everyone to feel loved and accepted as they are, not just by the people around them, but by themselves. It is possible to find you. It is possible to love you. It's all about becoming you. Thank you. Next, Richard Ganberry is here to speak about Reno County boxing, its history in our town, and why this competitive endeavor is important. Please welcome Richard with We Should All Have Something We Fight For. Good evening. My name is Richard Gadberry. I'm the founder and head coach of Reno County Boxing Academy, otherwise known as RCBA. I was invited here tonight by the ladies at the Hutchinson Community Foundation to talk to you about our program, how it came to be, what drives it, and why it's important. RCBA was formed in the spring of 2020, but the idea to open the gym came about the winter before. I was coaching in a gym at Wichita, and I just found myself frustrated with the training program and what I've seen is the mismanagement of the athletes. And uh, rather than try to fight the system, I just decided to open my own. I found a building, but it was hardly in any kind of shape to run a business out of. But after a couple months of late nights and long weekend, long weekends, we finally got it ready to open. Picked a real good time, too. I think it was the week after we opened is when COVID-19 put the world in a panic. All the USA boxing competitions came to a halt, and, uh, you know, the future of it was really up in the air. I, I don't think anybody had any idea what was going to happen. But we kind of limped along, just putting one foot in front of the other. The summer and the winter of 2020 was spent training up a new stable of boxers, the, those guys wouldn't have their chance to compete until February of 2021. But the time that got spent in the gym was well worth it. Uh, the first time they got to go do anything anywhere, the team went 5-1 and one that day, and they, they pretty well ran over their competition. Uh, since that night in Nebraska, boxers from RCBA have competed in almost 350 sanctioned bouts. In the past three years, we've produced 14 state champions, seven regional champions, one national champion, and also had a boxer take third at the Golden Gloves Nationals. 
As of 2023, RCBA has seven nationally ranked boxers with one of them that has a real shot at making the Olympic trials, and that's a that's a big deal. I mean, there just aren't very many of them. I mean, how many Olympic athletes do you know? How many, how many did you go to school with? Uh, RCBA is, registered, is a registered gym with USA Boxing and part of the Olympic movement. Um, I'm really proud to be a part of the U.S. Amateur Boxing Program. In my opinion, it's the best program on earth because it's comprised mainly of volunteers. I think it's 95%. That would include myself and the coaches at RCBA. There's a lot of ups and downs in the boxing world. There's a lot of ups and downs in any kind of competitive endeavor. But I think uh, how you make it through it depends a lot on who you surround yourself with. And I think we've built one of the best teams in the country. To those that are close to the sport, uh, the success of RCBA doesn't seem to really surprise them. There's, there's a really long history of amateur boxing in Hutchison. And one of, one of my goals is to see the sport make its ascendance again. And judging by all the measures that I have available to me, that's working. Uh, once again, Hutchinson's the home of the Kansas Golden Glove State Tournament, and it'll likely end up being the home of the Kansas Oklahoma Golden Gloves Regional Tournament. And to me, that makes perfect sense. Kansas Oklahoma Golden Gloves was started here in 1968, and just really happy to have the tournament back at home. Uh, as far as what drives it, what drives the program, there, there's just no part of this sport that I don't appreciate or, or respect. From, from the traveling to practice every night and even dealing with the tough losses, there's really nothing else I'd rather be doing. People always look at me funny when I talk about the importance of a loss. Uh, let me be really clear. I don't like losing to anything, not even checkers. But... But I'm also aware that learning to deal with disappointment has a great value attached to it. Um, you know, say you set yourself a goal and it's, it's no small goal and you got a big stage to accomplish it on and say you get it done. You know, there's, there's no better feeling, you know, for, for a short time, maybe the light shines on you a little different and things just don't seem to bother you and you're untouchable. But, uh, Say you fail, and say you fail in front of hundreds of people. Well, maybe maybe then you get to hang your head a little bit and let the guy next to you have that moment, have his moment. I can't uh, can't completely tell you why, but that's something that uh, I've always admired about the sport. Uh, another thing that I've always appreciated about it is the demand for honesty. Uh, you. Uh, you won't be a competent boxer and be a liar. It, it just, it won't work. And I don't necessarily mean in talking with other people. I mean, the lies we tell ourselves. I don't know if you can be a competent anything if you make a bad habit of doing that. Um, you know, you, you say you're this, you say you're that, that you're going to go do this and you're going to go do that. And then you find yourself at a national tournament and you get, you get thrown in there with somebody that, wants to win just as bad as you do. Uh, they don't care how hard you punch. They don't care how fast you are. They don't care what your friends have to say. They want to compete. And those, those times, like other serious times in life, that's when the truth matters. You know, there's, there's a thousand years of philosophy surrounding the sport. I could talk about it for the next three days and probably still wouldn't make my point. It's... It's just hard to tell you what it's about because it's about too many things. But, uh, you know, maybe sometimes it's not always about winning but competing well. And, you know, winning isn't everything, but, you know, the act of uh, never surrendering and actively pursuing the win is. Central Christian School has been blessed to provide child care in Reno County for over 43 years. During this time, the school has serviced thousands of kids and families. 
CCS is finding ways to think big with childcare to assist more students to grow and develop spiritually, intellectually, physically, socially, and emotionally. Here's Dr. John Walker with Thinking Big with Childcare. Thank you for having me. Childcare has been one of the most important aspects of life in the past century. With an evolving workforce, a solution for a loving, caring, and nurturing environment for children to learn has been absolutely crucial. Central Christian School has owned and operated a preschool and child care center since 1980, which is 43 years if you're able to do quick math, which makes Central Christian Preschool and Child Care Center as one of the oldest and proven sustainable entities for the last four decades in Reno County to offer these services. Each year, the school chooses a spiritual theme that the school as a whole reflects upon. Our students, child care age through 12th grade, learn truths from God's word with a focus on a variety of areas of school life on the theme. As an entire school, we are celebrating 75 years of offering a biblical worldview education. Having been, having been founded in 1948, a group of church leaders purchased the property on 8th and Chemical until it was destroyed by fire in the 1960s and moved to 30th and Halstead where it is today. In the late 1970s, modular units were purchased as a building expansion to add an elementary wing. Since the completion of the elementary wing, the leadership of CCS was thinking big with offering a child care solution in Reno County and opened its doors in 1980. This is a picture of my twin brother in 1994 at the preschool and child care center at Central Christian School. While we did not end up attending CCS for kindergarten through 12th grade, our family has a history of attending CCS. My mom and aunts all graduated from CCS. In 2022, through collaboration with students, staff, parents, administration, and board of trustees, CCS updated its mission statement to focus on the three E's of CCS, educate, equip, and edify every student to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Our big aim, our big goals, focus on our top five core values, which include a biblical worldview, discipleship, truth, and excellence in parental partnership. These core values guide and direct our focus and operations in tandem with our mission and our vision. As we think big with child care, we often think through various ways in which we can be innovative. What a blessing to provide an education for children ages one year old through 12th grade through an entire school system. This next picture is of our most recent graduating class in 2023. A handful of these students began in the preschool and child care center and stayed in the CCS system through their entire educational career. These students are well prepared to go on to college and are career focused. As we continue to think big with child care, our older students at CCS often volunteer their time at the preschool and child care center by teaching and, and, and interacting with children. Here you see two eighth graders who are investing into the lives of these young ones. Student to student interactions are helpful for both younger and older students. Our preschool and child care students also have diverse learning experiences, one of which is the opportunity to meet first responders. In our next picture, this picture here, you'll see students with the Hutch Fire Department. Hutch Fire Department is willing to instruct and care for these students by teaching them what to do in case of a fire along with the fun thing of climbing through a fire truck. Our students also have the opportunity to have hands-on experiences with live animals, like you see in this photo and the next. As we think big with child care, we see the absolute need for students to have the opportunity to have hands-on experiences with livestock and other animals. Many students in our program do not have access to learning about animals in this close-knit way because most of our students live in the city and have very limited interactions with animals and livestock in general. Besides the animals looking fun to touch, students learn about, how, learn about animals and how they impact our lives. As we think big with child care, we want our students to be adequately prepared for preschool and kindergarten. This drives our initiatives in STEAM-related activities. Science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics are all critical components to the learning environment at the preschool and child care center at Central Christian School. 
Our campus has been blessed to have earned a variety of grants over the years, leading to hands-on STEAM-related activities and equipment and as much outside time as possible. Students love the opportunity to learn inside and outside the classroom on any given day. Our students are in an environment where spiritual nourishment and shepherding of their hearts can happen. Students learn many scriptural truths throughout the day. Students are instructed in the Bible, along with other STEAM-related curriculum, providing a safe, clean, uplifting, and healthy environment for our students is our top priority. As we continue to think big with childcare, our students also have unique opportunities to participate in our gymnasium for play and for games, participate in our pep rallies, and participate in learning opportunities that are tied to our, quote, big school. Students love the opportunity to be around the big kids. As we continue to prepare for the future, CCS is proud to have an entire system from one-year-old through 12th grade. We have space on our campus where we are currently looking to expand our offerings. Having recently gained a significant grant, CCS continues to look for innovative ways of providing excellent child care and preschool services to our community. While these modular buildings have been a blessing for 43 years, we are now looking towards the future and future expansion at CCS for the next 43 years and we would invite any community member who is interested to tour our facilities, see our vision, and participate and come by and say hello. Lastly, we are thankful for a place where kindness is expressed and encouraged. In this next photo, you will see our kindness wall, where students are celebrated in moments where they show kindness to each other, reminding us how we as adults can show kindness to others too. In the words of, words of George MacDonald, the first thing that kindness deserves is acceptance, and the second, transmission. Thank you. This is the story of the Hustle Mania couple, how they started and what they've been doing. Anna and Jamar Crable will talk about what came out of a hard place in life circumstance that changed their lives, has given them some amazing experiences and pushed them to create the Hustle Mania uh, couple, and how all of that has been a gift. They're happy to be a couple who can share something together that's just lighthearted and fun. Please welcome Anna and Jamar with the life and times of the Hustle Mania couple. Hello, we are Jamar and Anna Crable, also becoming widely known as the Hustle Mania Couple. So our wrestling history started 18 years ago when we very first met. And some of our first dates were Jamar taking me to wrestling events. That was something that he grew up with and that I was new to. And so that was something that we shared in the beginning. Um, Part of the reason we started the Hustle Mania couple was that we had a very close family member, um, an aunt, to Jamar, who was like his second mother, and she passed away from COVID very unexpectedly. So that was a very hard trial, and he was, Jamar was depressed. And so he said, Anna, I'd love to start this thing and really have some passion and like spark my creativity and get that going. Um, to give us something to focus on together. And so that's really how the Hustle Mania started and grew. All right. So uh, we go back a slide or two. Uh, some of our greatest experiences in wrestling are uh, WrestleMania, if you don't know about wrestling. Uh, WrestleMania is the Super Bowl of pro wrestling. So we've been fortunate enough to attend three of those. We've attended WrestleMania 32, um, WrestleMania 38 and then 39 was most recent in Los Angeles. So um, it's a two day event um, that you uh, compile probably 70 to 100,000 people. All will, will fill a, usually a, a football stadium. And then it's usually four or five days with just crazy events. There's concerts, there's meet and greets and stuff like that. So we're fortunate enough to, to get experience three of those uh, WrestleMania events. Um, also, uh, some awesome experiences that we do at some of those WrestleMania um, events is we get to interact with some of the wrestling legends. Uh, if you go back to the wrestling legends, I think it's slide number three. 
Uh, those are some of the, the wrestling legends that we've got to meet. So uh, if you don't know some of them, you have uh, Ric Flair, probably the greatest wrestler, wrestler of all time. Uh, absolutely. Woo. <laughs> uh, the Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, uh, Bill Goldberg. Uh, that's all I could fit on there. So we've done a lot more than that. So those are some of our interactions. And just to meet those guys in real life has been just awesome to just tell them what they meant to you, uh, watch them grow up. Uh, just been awesome to find very fun um, experiences with that. We've met some of these amazing superstars by going to wrestling shows together, taking our kids. We have three boys. So that's been something that's been very fun to incorporate our whole family in and do together. Meet and grease, like, you know, get us to interact with some of these um, amazing superstars. So it's become a whole family thing with our boys. So I started with our oldest at a very young age. I remember taking him to, taking him to our, his very first WrestleMania. Uh, I think he's probably eight or nine years old. And then uh, it's evolved to our next two. As you can see there, they got their championship belts. Uh, watching wrestling weekly is a weekly occurrence for us, a family gathering for us. Um, they have their own masks, their own action figures. Uh, we post them on social media quite a bit, and it's fun to see a lot of the wrestlers will interact with them. They'll reshare them in their stories or posts. Um, even meeting a lot of those wrestlers, they'll, they'll be like, hey, we recognize you. You're, you're the ones that have those kids that like to dress up with us because they like to do cosplay um, in various, various, just various events throughout, throughout um, our household is, you know, is just incorporating wrestling. As you can see, we've been part of two amazing um, shows that have aired on A&E just recently. So we had producers reach out to us for both of those via social media on our page. And at first, Jamar didn't think they were real and wasn't going to respond. And I was like, maybe you should double check. Uh, so he did. And it was real. And they came to our house to film um, in the wrestling museum that's in our house that you saw. And then they another show um, flew us out to Vegas so that we could do a show with Stone Cold Steve Austin. So uh, stemming from one of those shows we had, like she said, the producer reached out to us. Um, I thought he was fake at first, so I ignore, ignored him for probably a good month. Um, I did some research and found out that he, will, he was a really a producer for WWE. Um, and then I, I ignored him again because I, normally when they go to come from this show, they want to uh, take this item. It's called WWE Most Wanted Treasures. They want to leave with the item that belonged to a specific wrestler. So I've watched last season and I kind of held off um, and Anna talked me into actually doing this show. So by that time, I think we had four weeks to build out this room uh, that you saw in there. All of our stuff was in boxes um, and not put up on nice <laughs> displays. Um, so by the show um, coming and et cetera, uh, we now have this awesome wrestling museum in our house. Uh, as I talked about, WWE Most Wanted Treasures uh, was on the A&E &E Network. Uh, they came to our house and filmed uh, back in December. I think it was about 11 hours of filming for a 30-minute show, so it was pretty intense. Uh, they don't tell you who's going to show up uh, at the time, so you're very surprised uh, when the when the individual excuse me the individual shows up. You know that someone's coming, but uh, we we're fortunate enough to have Mick Foley and Bill Goldberg. Um, show up at our doorsteps. And so that was an awesome experience. Uh, they spent the day with us. Um, the show ended up with a cool twist at the end. So you have to tune in and watch that. You can catch it on the AD uh, app or YouTube. There's some, some scenes on there. So that was an awesome experience. Um, and she talked about we had another experience. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just don't go. Oh, so we did have where they flew us out to Vegas, a different producer had reached out and we got to be part of the super fans that were in the audience for that. We've also gotten some really cool opportunities. Chalkline, um, who makes these jackets and different um, items for all kinds of brands reached out and asked us to be ambassadors for them. So they sent, have sent us a bunch of gear like this that we'll dress up in and take pictures in and promote their brand as well. Uh, why is wrestling important to Jamar? So, um, kind of my life, my childhood, kind of two words just comes to, to mind is just hard times. So, uh, wrestling was the one outlet that I had that I could feel like I could be a child and, and uh, look at my superheroes um, that I saw on TV. 
Um, so that was my a good outlet for myself to turn to as a child. Um, and then it, to incorporate my wife, like she said, some of my some of our first dates were to wrestling events. And now to dump that onto our boys and we're creating memories. We're going to these live events with them. We're watching it every week. Um, so just creating everlasting memories. And that's why it's so important to me. Why it's important to me is because it's important to him. And when you love somebody and you share a life together, it seems like you meld what you love. And so we grew together in that way. Um, and it's been something fun that as a couple, you get creative on something that doesn't have to be work and kids. It's something totally different. And so that's really been the passion of why I love to do it with him. Uh, some regional and local um, opportunities that we had. You can see there we had Good Day Kansas at our house last week. Um, I think those guys were uh, beyond thrilled. <laughs> they they uh, played with some of the, the wrestling belts and were just ecstatic. They couldn't believe what uh, we had in our house. So uh, that will air next Friday and the Friday after um, on Good Day Kansas. We also had uh, the Hutch News come out a couple times to feature us on their stories and Hutch posts. So we made uh, front page for a couple of those uh, local news outlets. This is just some of the fun creative stuff that Jamar creates. And he's also a professional photographer, so he's good with all the things. These are some of the people that are on his Mount Rushmore of greats. <laughs> uh, like she said, I, I do professional photography, so it's fun to create um, content with her whenever there's a wrestling pay-per-view. Um, whatever the theme is, I'll take pictures of her and then I'll, I'll make it like uh, the pay-per-view for whatever month that is. So. Uh, a lot of people recognize that throughout the world, and they're like, hey, can you make me something too? <laughs> so I'm, getting, getting, I'm beginning to get people to ask me to create stuff for them also. Um, you see that little mountain up there, the Mount Rushmore Wrestling. Uh, those guys were, you know, just my heroes the, on my uh, top four list uh, of wrestlers that, of all time to me. Uh, wrestlers that we still need to meet. So there's there's six guys there. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you recognize any of them. Probably The Rock is probably uh, the biggest well known on there. He's a he's a mega box office star. Um, so he's still on our on our who's who to meet. Future goal. Some of our future goals um, for the Hustle Mania couple is just to continue for us making it a mainstream thing. Sometimes I think pro wrestling was kind of taboo. We just love to be able to talk about it with other people. People will come up to us and say, oh my gosh, I love wrestling too, but I don't talk about it. I don't know who to talk about it with. And we're like, okay, we're game. You can talk to us. So uh, that's some of it. Uh, future goals, um, probably, hopefully more TV. We don't know, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, one of the producers in L.A. did reach out and talked about maybe having Stone Cold come out uh, for season two or three of his of his show. So that'd be awesome. We have several careers that he could choose from uh, to choose from uh, to do one of those careers. Um, and then just the lasting legacy, we just want to continue to be great brand ambassadors for pro wrestling, um, share the awareness, um, support the wrestlers for what they do. Um, they are away from their families probably two to 300, 300 year, days out the year, excuse me. Um, so we love to support them um, and just share, you know, our love for pro wrestling. Anything else? Chris Terrell decided to take on a problem, how to take a derelict structure on a vacant lot and turn it into a place of connections in the small community of Partridge in Reno County. With the help of the Hutchinson Community Foundation, Partridge Community Church started with a community garden and a pavilion. What next? Partridge is a town of about 250, located between two sets of railroad tracks nine miles west of Hutchinson. Originally called Reno Center, it had hopes of being named the county seat till C.C. Hutchinson convinced the legislature to add on to the north part of the county, making Hutchinson the center. Partridge Community Church was built in 1926 when the Congregational and Methodist Churches combined. The building was begun shortly after a tornado ripped down Main Street, destroying many of the businesses. 
My family has attended this church for several generations. My husband and I serve on the trustees. In 2018, our church purchased the lot to the north of our parking lot. The structure on the lot had been a blacksmith shop and an early gas station, but was currently in danger of falling in. A member of our church was hired to tear it down and dirt was spread to even out the surface after three failing locust trees were cut down. After two years of mowing this area, I kept asking myself, what could be done with it? In 2021, when we were meeting again in person, I proposed my idea to the church council and received an enthusiastic response. Most of our members are older and we had a wealth of memorial money bequeathed to the church. Why not use that money to make a gathering place for the community? Phase one included building a community garden and pavilion. The spring we started a community garden where produce and knowledge could be shared with anyone who was interested. We created seven growing beds 15 feet long with mulch paths between. Rich composted soil was located and hauled from a brush landfill. It had to be sifted from rocks. Help came from many places. Miriam Awashiki, our local master gardener, volunteered to help steer the whole project. We sought help from the Hutchinson Community Foundation and we were awarded a change maker grant to bring water and electricity under the parking lot to a location near where the garden and pavilion would be. Our community garden was prolific, growing beets, onions, potatoes, lettuce, beans, tomatoes, and more. A small group of dedicated volunteers met weekly to weed and harvest. Because we wanted to avoid herbicides and pesticides, fighting Bermuda grass was a weekly task. We shared our bountiful, bountiful harvest with anyone who wanted some. The pavilion was built at last. Our contractor was a one-man crew, wasn't able to begin our project till late July. The church council authorized more money to make the structure no maintenance with metal cladding and plastic railing. It has electricity and is handicapped accessible. The pavilion was completed in time for dedication over Labor Day weekend. As the work progressed, I suggested to my extended Terrell relatives that we make this a memorial to our parents and grandparents. And we pooled our money and the money already given in memory of family members. And we were fortunate to have the dedication as part of our family reunion. As we moved into 2023, it was time to begin phase two. This included planting shade trees, creating demonstration gardens, and paving a walking path. We worked with Dick Arboretum to plan our wildlife area of 80 plants that would need less water and attract birds and pollinators. Help with funding came from the Hutchinson Community Foundation with a fund for Reno County grant. In early spring, we picked out five large trees from a local tree farm. The owner not only dug and moved the trees with his tree spade, but did it for less than his usual price because he wanted to help. Community members were allowed to adopt a tree as memorials. We did lose one tree. When I traveled in Germany, I noticed that cemetery plots were more like demonstration gardens. The trustees constructed four eight by four foot beds that were adopted by myself and three fellow gardeners. Each was labeled the planting so that you could, people can use their ideas in their own gardens. So far we have a perennial bed and two annual beds and everybody waters is fit. The 2023 garden has been a place to gather weekly, bringing different people of the community together. Anyone interested and encouraged can pick whatever they need anytime. Children enjoy helping and are learning a bit about worms, vegetables, and taking care of the soil. We added perennial verbs, herbs, rhubarb, and asparagus. The city of Partridge was replacing the curbs and guttering along our block up Main Street. Part of our sidewalk was crumbling and needed to be replaced. We asked the city council for $850 to replace it. They gave us a thousand because they appreciate the efforts that we've made for the community. The dirt pile moved. A uh, drip watering system was installed in the community garden as we began our spring planting. The system designed by Miriam's husband allows water directly to the areas where it's needed. It has been difficult to keep watering systems working since everyone has access to the faucet. We were having difficulty getting word out about the efforts we were making. We decided to try a mailing to all Partridge addresses. Our, on the advice from our postmistress, we made 244 by six postcards, but when she called her supervisors, we had to do it again and make them all bigger. Finally, the postcards arrived in everyone's mailbox. We sponsored a SAG stop for Bike Across Kansas for the second year in a row. From the pavilion, we handed out homemade pie and cinnamon rolls to over 500 riders. 
Three sisters brought in their special mint tea. Most bikers had their picture taken under our bike arch. Jason Probst wrote on Facebook, Partridge, Kansas is getting a reputation on BAK. It's going to be difficult to ever take another route that doesn't go through this magical and beautiful people. The mailing told everyone of the event held June 30th. Jim French put on a wonderful concert of songs for young and old. Free hot dogs and drinks were served from a festive stand brought by the maintenance man. Even though the day was hot, the audience enjoyed the music with the time to visit as we watched children dancing and play. There remains work to be done, but our efforts are making a difference. Dr. Geltner, in his book, Awe, writes, encounters lead people to feel more inspired and optimistic. They feel more integrated in their community, that expanding circle of care. Their faith in their fellow humans and hope for human prospects rise. They hear a voice akin to a calling to become a better person, and they often imitate others' acts of courage, kindness, strength, and overcoming. This is our hope for the area moving forward. We want we hope that the completion of phase two will attract more use. Our gathering to grow project would not have been possible without many people's efforts. And I especially want to thank my husband, Jamie Funky, who had no choice but to be the general contractor. <laughs> and together we're making our dream a reality. Awesome. Let's give all of our presenters one more round of applause. Okay. I hope I speak for all of us in saying that was a pretty inspiring lineup um, tonight. And um, we might have a run uh, on hot dogs the next time you do it, something at Partridge, guys. So <laughs> keep keep the grill going. Um, Remember that if you want to keep the spirit of community going tonight, you're welcome to gather at Sand Hills Brewing after this. Um, I do want to do, make some thank yous before we part. Um, thank you to Christopher Acker over here on the side with Salt City Sound for running our live stream. Um, that is a cool new feature that we have, thanks to Christopher's talents. Um, thank you to Lucas Singleton of the Hutchinson Public Library who does the audio and, and the video and puts it all together. Um, we, we will share these videos, um, separately, um, as we make time for it. We are, we all do this on the side of our real day jobs. Um, but we do archive these talks at talk20.com and share them back on our Facebook page and YouTube. Um, and thank you always to the Hutchinson Public Library staff and Greg. Um, they provide the seats, the space, the equipment, um, and all the people power to put it together. Um, and the rest of us do the work in the behind the scenes and then show up and do the show. So um, thank you, Greg and team for hosting us. Um, and I'll just encourage you, if you have a story to tell um, or so you know of somebody who should sh share their story, please let us know. Um, we're always taking ideas. Uh, and then we hope to see you again in January 2024, where we will hit the 10th anniversary of Talk 20 Hedge. So You'll have a wonderful rest of your evening and summer, and we appreciate you so much.